Happy Easter morning. Well, I think we should probably talk about the resurrection for the sermon this morning. What do you think? Before we do that, I want to acknowledge the situation that happened in Sri Lanka. I don't know if you pay attention to the news. Uh, There were eight churches that were bombed this morning. Uh, Obviously, on purpose, they did it on Easter morning in Sri Lanka, which is that little teardrop country southeast of of India. Um, We don't know who did it. We can assume probably they were not exactly friends of Christianity. So let's, let's pray about the people in the situation there before we start. Father, it, it saddens us to know that people hate Jesus and hate what we stand for. And by God, uh, that's, that's the world. It's a fallen world. But God, we're going to proclaim Jesus in his resurrection from the dead. And we know that if we're faithful to you, even if we are killed for our faith, that we too will be raised from the dead on the final day. Father, be with those who've had this situation. I know there's a couple hundred that were killed. So it's a sad situation, God, but I believe that the sin in the world is even a worse situation. God, help us in our service today to be encouraged by the resurrection of Jesus. And it's his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, resurrection power. Okay. Power has to go to the channel, the changer, not channel changer, but the clicker. Okay, great. So what, what, why is the resurrection so important? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. Paul said something interesting about the resurrection. And actually, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 is the, the most, uh, the deepest, most thorough treatise on the re- resurrection in the entire Bible. We're going to come back to this passage at the end of our sermon. All right, 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 13. It says, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. More than that, we are found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise from the dead if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you're still in your sins. Now, I thought we were were saved by the death of Jesus. I thought that was the whole deal. The whole shooting match, the whole shebang. But apparently, the resurrection is important. Because if Christ wasn't raised from the dead, then you're in your sins. And you know what? I want to declare t- this. I have two parts in my sermon this morning. Part number one is Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Amen. And then point number two, that's the, the, the title of our sermon, is the power of the resurrection. I don't know about you, but I'm into power. I want some power. By the way, that's our, uh, that's our brother, Kaido. Now, he's a powerful dude. He leads our church in Tallinn and Estonia. I I spent the evening at his house one time, went to his health club. Apparently, he's like world champion heavyweight powerlifter, and he has uh, deadlifted 700 pounds. That's power. But I'm telling you, compared to resurrection power, that ain't nothing. That ain't nothing. So I want to talk about, first of all, why I believe in the resurrection. The resurrection is essential to Christianity because if Christ was raised from the dead, that means there's life after death. And if there's life after death, there's hope. And if there's anything we need, we need hope. So point number one is why I know that it is a fact, or as close to a fact as anything we know, that Jesus was raised from the dead. I want to talk about three facts. Fact number one is this. It is a historical fact that Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem under the orders of Pontius Pilate. How do we know this? Well, you could read the Roman um, um, historian. His name is Tacitus, the most well-known Roman historian of the first century who possibly just might know. He said, to squelch the rumor, 
Uh, Nero created scapegoats and subjected to the most refined tortures those whom the common people call Christians, a group hated for their crimes. Their name comes from Christ, who during the reign of Tiberius had been executed by the procurator Pontius Pilate. Fact number one that we have to deal with is that Jesus was executed by crucifixion in Jerusalem. So why, why am I going into all this evidence type stuff? Well, David Hume famously said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. Now, I don't know, do people get resurrected from the dead kind of on a regular basis? Have you heard about it happening? Does science kind of predict this is something that's likely to happen? Okay, so we have to have some pretty strong evidence here. But I believe that any reasonable person who looks at the evidence is going to come to the same conclusion. I could quote from Josephus, from Thallus, from the Babylonian Talmud, and all that other stuff. It's in the notes. Look it up on my website. I'm not going to go into all that. I'm assuming you're willing to accept that, yes, yeah, probably is actually true. He probably was actually executed by crucifixion in Jerusalem. Fact number two, from the very beginning, we're not talking about 30 years later, 50 years later, from the very beginning, in Jerusalem, the resurrection was proclaimed, not only proclaimed, but also believed. And it, it, I won't read the scripture, but in Acts 2.24, uh, Peter says, uh, Jesus did many signs, wonders, and miracles, as you yourselves know. And people didn't go, really? Never heard about that. That's, that's news to me. And it says, and God raised him from the dead. So there you have thousands of people living, being in Jerusalem, the place where it happened, and they believe that it, he was raised from the dead. So it is a fact. Now, whether it's a fact that he was raised, we can talk about that. It, fact number one, he was executed. Fact number two, the, rev, the, the resurrection was proclaimed in Jerusalem, in the immediate context, by the people who knew him. And then the third fact, that's my favorite fact of the three. The third fact is the tomb was empty. Now, I guarantee you the tomb was empty. Because when Peter got up on the day of Pentecost and said, but God raised him from the dead, if the tomb had not been empty, what would have happened? People would have said, wait a minute, come over here. Here's his body. It is a fact that Jesus was killed in Jerusalem and that the resurrection was proclaimed and that his tomb was empty. That's as much a fact of history as any other fact we have from history, all three of those things. So how are we going to explain that? Now, Generally, when something happens, would, would the resurrection of the dead be a, a, a normal explanation of something that happened, all right? For example, I haven't seen somebody for a month, and you heard they were in a car accident, and then you saw them alive. Do you think, all right, probably they were resurrected from the dead? Would that be the first thought? No, probably not. So what are some possible explanations of this empty tomb? All right, well, different explanations have been given. All right, okay. Here we go. Oops, this thing is acting funny. It does that every once in a while. Okay. All right, so the explanations that I've heard. Uh, and by the way, if you want to, the, the experts on trying to figure out what actually happened would be Jewish people from back in that time. All right, they had kind of a stake in this whole situation. We could ask, what did they say about it? All right, but the only theories I've ever heard that, that even deserve even mention are, number one, maybe somebody took his body and that's why the tomb was empty. That, that could potentially explain, consistent with him being killed, obviously, consistent with it being proclaimed, I guess, and with the tomb being empty. That's one possibility. Another possibility is the reason the tomb was empty is because he really didn't actually die. All right? And a third possibility, which would be the least likely, though, of the three up there, the third possibility is Jesus was bodily resurrected from the dead, based on science, which is looking the most likely up there. Uh, the le which is the least likely? The third one. Okay, you have to admit that we need to consider the first two. In fact, I think it'd be fair to say the first two might be the most reasonable first guess. All right, so what about it? Uh, possibly his body was stolen. 
So I want to talk about whether that's reasonable. All right, so Jesus has died. He's been killed and executed and put in this tomb. And as it says in Matthew, they rolled a massive stone in front and they placed a Roman guard. Now, the Roman soldiers were the most feared soldiers of the ancient world. Was it 10? Was it 30? We don't know. All right, so some people say, well, they took the body. Now, would the Jews have taken the body of Jesus? Well, they, they might have. Because if you're, all right, because we heard, because Jesus said, you know, destroy this temple to be raised on the third day. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that body, we're going to hide it out so that nobody else could take it. But then what would they have done right away? They would have said, hello, over here. All right, the idea that the Jews would have stolen the body and then not later showed it is insane. All right, would the Jews... I'm sorry, would the Romans have stolen the body or, or removed it? Why would they want to do that? Now, the whole, the whole fear, in fact, part of the whole thing about killing Jesus was people were kind of getting excited about him. Maybe they have a little revolution going on here, a little problem, a little political unrest. The last thing you want to do is have an empty tomb. Nobody in their right mind would ever propose that the Romans would have stolen the body. So really, if anybody took the body, it would have had to be the Christians. Now, would the Christians have taken their Jesus' body? Now, the question is, why would they do that? What was the situation? Jesus is dead and in a tomb, and people, uh, the apostles' hope has been destroyed. They're hiding and under fear of death. And here's the proposal. I know what we're going to do. We're going to steal the body. And then we're going to say he was raised from the dead, so we can spend the rest of our life under threat of death and live our life as a total lie because we just wanted to see people about Jesus. Okay, would, would they have done that? that that's insane. That, that makes no sense at all. So let's imagine they, they had this crazy idea. I don't know. They say, all right, sure, let's go steal the body. All right, now we got a little problem here, which is there's this Roman guard standing in front of the temple. I don't know, do you, do you, know, do you know karate? Do you have a little, uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe we could bring a stick with us. So what we're going to do is we're going to charge these Roman soldiers uh, with, I don't know, karate chops and uh, I don't know, whatever they had back then. And we're going to kill them all and then steal the body and people won't notice that this happened. They, they, they won't figure it out. I think it probably would have made the, new, the Jerusalem Post the next day. The, 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 the 14 Roman soldiers killed, plus probably at least 87 apostle and other people doing it. Uh, the idea that his body was stolen is just, I'm sorry, but it's absolutely ridiculous. No sane person could believe that. Now, we're down to two possibilities, all right? Either Jesus never really actually died, or he was raised from the dead bodily, in which case you're not still in your sins and your faith is reasonable. So does it make any sense whatsoever that Jesus didn't actually die? Let's think about it. All right, he had been without food and water for you know, about three days or so. He was, he was beaten. And when they, when they do that with a flagellum, I mean, uh, 39, uh, 40 minus 1, 39 lashes, and this flagellum with, the, with the, the pieces of bone and rock and glass, his, his back torn into shreds, and then beaten with sticks and rods, no water, no food. And then he's crucified, which is normally fatal. Normally fatal. And you think the Romans would have been mistaken about this? I don't think so. And besides, uh, basically, the way it works with the crucifixion, we were just talking about this. We had a study. It was so cool. We're doing a cross study with Alan on Friday. We're like, I mean, getting to the end of the study, like, do you realize how awesome this is? Sort of sad in a way, but awesome in another way. We're studying about the cross on Good Friday. That was, that was kind of cool. But anyway, so the idea then is, see, when you're crucified, 
Uh, the idea is the only way to stay alive is to push up with your feet. Otherwise, you suffocate within a few minutes. And as soon as you stop pushing up on your feet, you'll be suffocated within a few minutes. That's why they broke the legs of the other two, uh, of the two thieves. Because once they break their legs, within three or four minutes, they'll be dead. But obviously, Jesus was already dead. Once you're hanging limp on the cross, you can't sort of fake a death hanging limp on a cross. How about for an hour? Do you think the Romans knew a little bit about what it looked like, what a dead person looked like? So here we have this person, no food, no water, uh, beaten to the point where he might have died anyway, and then crucified. He's been dead. And then there's the thing with the sword, right, or the, the spear in his side. And what John says, read it in John 19, is when they put the spear in him, Blood and water separated came out. Now, I'm not a doctor, but what I've heard is that the blood and the serum separate roughly an hour after you're dead. Do you think John knew that blood and water separated about an hour after you're dead? Where did that fact come from? So here's this theory. This guy, no water, no food, uh, beaten nearly to death, and then executed and dead, and then given another wound, which certainly would have killed him, which proved he was already dead because the blood and water were separated. And then he's wrapped up in these things, and he wakes up, kind of shakes himself off, moves the massive stone, and then he has to karate chop all those soldiers and, and go through, and they didn't notice, and they didn't mention anything later. Okay, so what are we left with then? We've got the fact of the crucifixion. The fact of its declaration in Jerusalem, right there, and the fact of the empty tomb. There's only one explanation. Does it defy logic? Does it defy science? It defies a lot of things. You know what's the most thing it defies? It defies death. Brothers and sisters, Jesus was raised from the dead. That's a pretty amazing thing. Now let's go, let's, we're still in 1 Corinthians 15. Let's read 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 through 7. Actually, you know what? I think there's another fact we could talk about. I said three facts, but I'd argue there's really four facts. Uh, executed. Declared, empty tomb. How about fact number four? Let's read 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 3. Now what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. Now, how many eyewitnesses would it take? Fact number four, I believe, is this. He was alive. He was alive. Again, how many eyewitnesses would it take? How about two? All right, how about... Ten. How about 500 of them who saw him alive? And, and Paul's and he's basically saying most of them are still alive today. Basically, if you don't believe him, ask one of them. But you know what? It's going to be kind of hard to ask them because they're all in hiding because all of them are under threat of death. To the day they died, all 500 eyewitnesses were under the threat of death. Did any of them ever recount what they said? Not one. Now, if you read the Book of Mormon, by the way, I love my Mormon friends, but it has three witnesses, and if you read the, the, the account, there's three witnesses of the golden tablets. You know what happened to all three of them? They all three changed their mind, you know? I don't know. I don't know about that. Again, not, not against, nothing against those people. They're, they're great people, all right? But I, I don't know. Jesus was raised from the dead. 
A, a couple other things about the resurrection. First of all, we should have known it was coming. In fact, look what it says right here. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says, and, um, in verse uh, 4, he was buried and raised on, uh, on the third day according to the scriptures. So it was prophesied. And the Bible has lots of prophecies, but one of those prophecies is resurrection on the third day. Now, where is that prophecy? Where in the Bible does it say, as a prophecy, that the Messiah would be raised on the third day? Hmm. Well, how about in the book of Jonah? How about in Jonah, chapter 1, verse 17? All right, what's it say in Jonah 1, verse 17? How long was Jonah in the belly of that fish? For three days and three nights. Now, the Bible doesn't say exactly what happened to Jonah in that fish, but I, I'm thinking what happened is he died. Because, I don't know, I, I guess I can't prove it, but given the fact that Jonah was probably, either way, he was, in, he was as good as dead. I mean, generally being swallowed by a big fish, you're kind of, that's kind of, it's over for you. You know, it's generally, that's the last chapter, okay? So Jonah was raised from the dead on the third day. You know who else was raised from the dead on the third day? His name was Isaac. God said to Abraham, go to Mount Moriah. The son, the promised son, he said, go to Mount Moriah and kill your son. And, and on, on which day was it he arrived at Mount Moriah? On the third day he arrived on Mount Moriah. And in Hebrews 11, verse 19, it says, figuratively, Abraham received his son back from the dead on the third day. But there's actually another prophecy of the resurrection. I, I know I'm, I'm, kind, of, I'm kind, of going, kind of going deep on you, kind of a deep dive on this one. Have you ever heard of the Feast of First Fruits? The Feast of First Fruits. You mean to tell me you have not read Leviticus 23, 9 through 14 about the feast? All right, so we got somebody who's read it. That too was a prophecy of the resurrection. Now, probably a lot of you know that Jesus was killed on the night before the Passover. Why was Jesus killed the night before the Passover? Because Jesus is the Passover lamb. And when did they kill the Passover lamb? The night before the Passover. And they didn't break any of the Passover lamb's bones either, as Jesus' bones weren't broken. Got it? So Jesus was killed on the eve of the Passover because he's the Passover lamb. But did you know the day that Jesus was raised from the dead? It was Sunday. And that is the Feast of First Fruits. All right, it's the 17th of Nisan which is not a car company. It's a month in the Jewish year. Okay, got it? Now, I know a little bit of a deep dive here, but it's interesting. The Feast of First Fruits, it was a harvest festival, and it was held, basically said, take some of the wheat. I know it's not ready to harvest. It's just come up, cut some of it down anyway, and come to Jerusalem and celebrate the harvest. It was a harvest festival when there was no harvest. What a strange festival that was. For over a thousand years, every year, the Jews celebrated a harvest festival when there was no harvest. What's that about? It's about Jesus. Because what is Jesus anyway? He's the first fruit from the dead. Let's just flip over a couple of verses. Let's flip over to 1 Corinthians 15. All right, I think it's right here in my outline. Yes, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 22. By the way, we're going to get to the power of the resurrection. We're almost there. I just want to make one more comment. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now, what was the first fruits festival? Basically, they said, celebrate the harvest, even though we don't have a harvest yet. What was that about? Like Jan said, it's about faith. It's the, the faith that the harvest is going to come. So what is the resurrection of Jesus then? He's the first fruits from the dead. He's the resurrection before the resurrection. The, feast, the, the, the first fruits was the harvest before the harvest. 
Jesus is the resurrection before the resurrection. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, we have faith that we, too, will be raised from the dead, and we have hope. Let me read on. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. So as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. I want to talk just briefly about the power of the resurrection. This is powerful stuff, folks. Let's read Romans 1.4. Uh, we're going to just blitz through just a couple of scriptures here. Romans 1, verse 4. He's talking about Jesus, a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God through power by his resurrection from the dead. Let me ask you a question. How much power would it take to raise somebody from the dead? Let's imagine, let's say somebody's been dead for, I don't know, say for three days, just, just as an example. I don't know where I came up with three days, just, just as an example. Let's imagine all of us were sit around and kind of like, you know, meditate or, I don't know, do whatever thing and kind of, you know, do you think that would, that would do it? What about if we took all the electrical power? We'll take all the electrical power and we'll just sort of put it into that body. Would that raise it from the dead? All right, what about medical science? What if we applied all of our medical knowledge, dead for three days, all of our medical knowledge? By the way, I want to recommend a movie, Breakthrough. The guy was dead for 45 minutes. That's a great, that is awesome. If you can see that movie, it's great. But we're not talking about under the ice 45 minutes, all right? We're talking about dead for three days. What does science have to say about that? If you're in Christ, the power that raised Jesus from the dead is in your life. That's power, folks. That's real power. And it's working in us. God's power raised him from the dead. Romans 6. Romans 6. Let's talk about what the resurrection means to us. By the way, the resurrection doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless we have the execution, right? Because if Jesus wasn't die, hadn't died, he wouldn't need to be raised. All right? And why did he have to die? Because of our sins. Romans 6, 2 through 5. He's talking about, should we take advantage of God's grace? He says, no way. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We are therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. But For if we have been united with, with him in a death like this, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, we can have a new life. That's good news, folks. So my old life was kind of corrupt. I don't know about yours. Now, maybe you were like a really awesome, amazing person without sin. But my life, it was corrupted. It was defiled. And when we're baptized, by the way, speaking of baptism, I was trying to figure out what it says back there. I was trying to, okay, R-I-L-T-I-S-M, I think that's April Baptism Awareness. Do you think that's April Baptism Awareness Month? I think that's what it is. It's Baptism Awareness. April, is that true? Look it up. That's just my imagination. I don't know, maybe. Now, you shouldn't be looking at that while I'm preaching, but I, I've been looking at that while, I don't know. Mike was doing an awesome job, but I just happened to notice that. Anyway, great. <laughs> Folks, we messed up real bad. But because of the resurrection of Jesus, we are created anew. We die with Christ. But you know what? If you die with Christ, it's like you baptize somebody, you hold them under. That, you know, that's, that's not a good thing. You know, they need to come up, back up out of that water. And we're raised to live a new life. Can we get an amen on being raised to a new life? All right? Uh, you know, that, that's a pretty good stuff. That's power. We got some stuff to celebrate here. All right, how about how about uh, the power to overcome sin? Let's keep reading. 
All right? For we know that the old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if you died, all right, but then you're dead, okay? You died, and then what happened after that? You were raised with Christ. And you're free from sin. Sin does not have the enslavement power over you. Like Mike said, we do still sin. And I really appreciate 1 John chapter 1 there. If you claim you're a sin, you don't sin, you're a liar. But we're not controlled by sin. We're freed. We have the ability to stop sinning. Philippians 3, 10 and 11. I love this one. I love this passage. All right. How am I? Uh, I'm going to skip the, the first Peter one because I ran out of time. But Philippians 3, 10 and 11. I love what Paul says about the power of the resurrection. He says here... <clears throat> I want to know Christ, <clears throat> yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his, his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to obtain the resurrection from the dead. Now, he says, so somehow to obtain the resurrection of the dead. Now, I read that verse many, many times, and I thought, yeah, somehow, somehow, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying, he's saying, somehow. I mean, whether it's this, that, or the other, I don't know what it is, but one thing I know is, because of the resurrection of Jesus, which is the first fruit, it's the promise. It's like, I went there, been there, done that, it's going to happen to you as well. Like Daniel said in, 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 in Daniel 12, verse 3, multitudes will rise from the dead. And we're going to be given new bodies. Let's, let's learn a little bit about those new bodies. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15. All right. 1 Corinthians 15. You ready to be encouraged with a passage here? Starting at verse 50. I like encouraging sermons, and I have to say... I don't know if it, how good a job it is, but the, the idea is pretty encouraging, that's for sure. I, 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 was, I was about to brag, so I said this. <laughs> so never mind, anyway. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must close itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Yeah, your labor is not in vain because you know what's going to happen. At the last trumpet call, you're going to be raised to life. And you're going to have a body, exactly what that body is going to be like. I don't really know. Five fingers, seven fingers, no fingers. I don't really know. But I know this. It's going to be an imperishable bo body. That's what God has in store for us. How do we know that? Oh, Jesus was raised from the dead. I mean, it's a fact. He was executed. The resurrection was preached in Jerusalem in front of those who would have known better. The tomb was empty. And by the way, given the 500 eyewitnesses, he was alive. Therefore, we have power. Power to live a new life. Power to overcome sin. Power to change. I want to end our sermon at a tomb 
but not at Jesus' tomb. I want to end our sermon at Lazarus' tomb. Let's just go there briefly, and let's look at what Jesus said to Mary and Martha. You know the story. Lazarus had been dead not for three days, actually four days. They asked Jesus to come, but he was busy. Besides, he knew what was going on. He knew exactly what he was doing. He was on his way to Jerusalem to be crucified and later resurrected. He comes into Bethany, where his very, very good friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, lived. Lazarus has been dead for four days, and he goes, and let's see what he said in uh, John 11, 21 through 26. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Amen. She had some faith there. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever believes uh, uh, in me will never die. Do you believe this? And Jesus is asking you that right now. Do you believe this? that he is the resurrection and the life. You know what he did just a few minutes later? He went out to the tomb. He says, roll back the stone. And they very wisely said to him, Jesus, he's been dead for four days. It smells bad. Jesus says, roll back the stone. And you know what Jesus said, right? He said, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus walked out of that tomb. He said, take the, the burial strips off of him. I love verse 45. It says, therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. Yeah, I, I would think so. But you know what? Not everybody believed in him. If you go down to uh, verse 53, some that were there decided to kill him. Did they decide to kill him because they didn't think he raised Lazarus? No, they decided to kill him because they thought he killed Lazarus. We talked about this a little while ago. And so I want to ask you, what's your response to the resurrection? Are you going to go out of here and say, that was really encouraging. That's, that's really awesome. I, I, I think our response to the resurrection is important. Because what are you going to do with your life? Are you going to let the resurrection affect your life? Because it gives you power to have a new life, but what if you won't live a new life? What if you haven't been baptized into Christ? You don't even have that new life. But we're here to declare this morning that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Praise the Lord.